Welcome to Coffee House, where we talk about good books, bad books, and big ideas. Today we have a glorious and wonderful day, because it's always a glorious and wonderful day when you get to read Thomas Sowell. One of the, if not the, preeminent question that is facing us today, that I have phrased occasionally as the part of the whole problem. But the question is, why do some groups have more than others? Is it injustice? And should our entire society be flattened from the top down to ensure that there are no disparities? This book is called Discrimination and Disparities, published in 2018, had an update in 2019, and in its soul tries to frame the question of disparities in a way that helps us get closer to the truth and shirk from the knee-jerk inflammatory moral outrage. Now, of course, this has been the engine to much of the conversation nationally and increasingly internationally, especially in majority white countries. We have been talking about this, the disparities and discrimination. And one of our current political parties is just writing this into oblivion. So, it's a good topic to talk about, and it's a timely book for sure. Of course, as we always do, we are going to talk about the contents, then we go into a bit of an analysis where we talk about the quality of the book, and then we'll talk big picture so we can be better people and try to fold it into a bigger idea, a bigger arc about our understanding of the world and the way it works. So, the contents. Of course, there is way too much to talk about to be able to get through. As you will find once I get to the end, I will recommend that just everybody read it. Get it for your mother, your kids, your father, your dog. Just read it to any reptiles you have in your house. Just just get the book and read it. But we're going to go through a lot of the important points right now because I know you're busy. You've got other things to do and it's easier to digest a 20-minute podcast about a book than to actually read the entire book. <laughs> Here we go, the contents. It's opening starts with painting the picture of the spectrum of explanations for why there are differences between people. Now, it can go all the way from some people are genetically less capable than others to on the other side that they're all victims of oppressors, and that's the reason that there are disparities. And there's more disparity between groups than chance would seem to allow for or suggest, so there has to be something else going on here. There are prerequisites to success. Everybody can agree to that. Now, some people might say that it just takes one thing, but one thing that the book points out here is that the prerequisites to success in any given field or any given discipline are almost certainly more numerous than that. The example here is used as if there are five prerequisites to success, then you should not expect that there is going to be equal distribution. If there's just a single factor that leads to success, then you would expect that there's a bell curve distribution of that particular prerequisite, and so you'd have a pretty easy-to-predict way to determine whether there's injustice in this kind of a system. But anything that's worth doing is going to have a whole bunch of prerequisites when it comes to people and all the various things they could be engaged in. People are not going to have control of all the prerequisites either. So even if there are some that they might have control over, there are many that they might not. So one study was about these people. They followed just a group of people who had IQs over 140, which is significantly high IQ, to see if IQ was simply predeterminative of the success of people. This would be saying that there's a single prerequisite. As long as you have this, then you're going to be successful. And in this single group that had these high IQs, they saw a large disparities between the people and how they did when it comes to economically and other metrics of success. So they had the IQ down, but there are a whole bunch of other things that were required to be successful. And the distribution of different prerequisites could be very different. So you could have a bell curve distribution for one and then very skewed distributions of the other ones. And then you have to have all of them together to be able to get there. So it's actually not a surprise that we don't have randomly distributed characteristics that lead to success and uh, that we have a perfectly representative system of successful people. Now, we can look at empirical evidence related to this. It's not just amongst people and their complex systems and the things that they try to do, but it's also within nature. In nature, you have skewed distributions and you have giant disparities. More empirical evidence related to it specifically is the firstborn overrepresentation. So firstborn or overrepresented in higher status fields and in education, or higher education. So obviously the firstborn would have the same family and be under the same household. So would seemingly have most of the same, if not precisely the same kind of upbringing and biology and still end up being overrepresented in higher education. 
So that undermines both nature and nurture when it comes to determining what determines success. So there are a number of implications that result from this, is that it's not automatic that you're going to have equal and randomly distributed skills and abilities that are going to be prerequisites for being successful. The world has never been a level playing field. It's inaccurate to merely blame the sins of humans as if they have some kind of godly control over the way things happen. You need hard evidence to show that it's either genetics or discrimination or some combination of those things. So obviously, in the first instance, genetics would be the kind of standard racist tract that says that some people are inferior, just plain inferior, based on genetics, whereas the discrimination argument would be that it's just people who are racist are making these arbitrary determinations to say that these people are lesser, and so they're being overburdened and therefore not as successful. Now, of course, the reality is we don't know necessarily that either one of those is true or false. What we do know is that you need evidence to be able to demonstrate that those things are the case. As examples of incorrectly using this kind of thinking, you have on the two sides, even though these things are very realistically intertwined, you have Nazism and Communism. So one, the former, blamed an inferior race for the problems in the country, and the other blamed exploiters for the problems in the country. And in their books whether it's Mein Kampf or those written by communist leaders, they did not treat these things as testable hypotheses. They treated them as foregone conclusions. But they were still using this kind of thinking that suggested that everything would be equal or the German people would have more, but for the inferior Jewish race or for communism, everybody would have more and be doing better, but for the exploitative class who's exploiting all the workers. So what we have to do is first we have to get a definition of discrimination. We have to understand it so we can understand what it means and what the costs related to it are. The definition that's provided here in this book I think are very important to understand. So he has different categories. Number one, it's like type one discrimination or the first definition for it is the ability to determine differences in qualities. So this is you're looking for empirical evidence to try to determine the, the differences in qualities. And discrimination type two, the second definition, would be treating people negatively based on on arbitrary conclusions based on their relations to a group. So this would be the kind of traditional idea of what racial or sex discrimination would be, is that you just decide arbitrarily that they have these negative characteristics or that another race has positive characteristics just based on their group membership. Now there are differences in costs between the two definitions of discrimination. And then he breaks it down further. So the first one, like I said, this is the one that's based on empirical evidence or observation. It breaks down into two categories. There's one A where you do this discrimination based on individuals. So an individual you discriminate against because you have evidence about them empirically about what they can and can't do so you make a discriminatory determination. And uh, of course it has a pejorative connotation nowadays to say this but obviously we discriminate against things left and right in our day-to-day -day life whether it's in dating or anywhere else. So uh, this is not meant strictly to be pejorative. This is strictly meant to try to understand what this means. So 1A is based on individuals. You discriminate against an individual because you have empirical evidence of how they are and who they are. The second one is less ideal. It's 1B and it's discriminating against groups because you have some empirical evidence about who they are or what they are. So for instance in 1B you could have a particular group that has 40% alcoholics. 40% of this group is alcoholics. So you decide okay I'm just not going to hire anybody from group B because there's a much higher percentage chance that they could be alcoholics and there are all sorts of costs associated with hiring alcoholics so they Therefore, it keeps me away from those basing this on this group identification and this kind of discrimination. Another example of this would be where companies, would, at certain points, uh, you know, they would do background checks and they would do them for everybody. So this would be discrimination type 1A. It's based on individuals. So you just do a criminal background check on everybody and whatever that comes up with is how you make your determination to discriminate against this person or not. But what happens is that you would end up with a disparity in certain areas where it would disproportionately disqualify black applicants. Because in these particular areas, geographical areas, you would have black applicants who have a, a higher degree of criminal backgrounds. So what would happen is that people would decry the use of background checks saying that they're, you're disqualifying qualifying, uh, a bunch of black applicants on this basis so you can't do criminal background checks. But then you're switching to 1B, discrimination 1B, type 1B, is that you're 
would now have to discriminate against groups because you know the group has a higher incidence of of this particular characteristic whereas under 1a when it's about individuals then you hire you end up hiring more black applicants because you find the ones that don't have these and who are qualified for the job so the problem is you shouldn't misdiagnose the kind of bias that's going on just because there's a disparity at the other end and there are situations where the law-abiding majority can suffer because of the criminal minority. So this is more just misdiagnosing the bias and engaging in policies that are bad for everybody. So you have a law-abiding majority in a particular area. You have a criminal minority. And what happens is the businesses begin to avoid this area because of the cost of doing business there. And then the people who are law-abiding in this area pay the price for what other people are doing. And in these areas, the cause of high prices isn't the people who are posting those prices. We talked about this in his other book, I believe we had this issue come up where because there's more theft, there's more security necessary, and and all those sorts of costs are increased, you have to increase the costs of the items themselves. And then activist groups will say that it's type 2 discrimination, that you're just doing it based on arbitrary conclusions related to somebody's race, and they have every incentive to do that because it's just part of their activism and they can get more followers and get more attention and get more money and all that sort of thing. But the reality is you get the same effect when you ha are dealing with lower income whites. So there was this thing called the hillbilly tax in areas with low income whites where they would have to increase prices in the same thing like in the convenience store to try to offset the extra costs that are attendant with being in this lower income area. And things that people don't realize, so something that you have Walmart who can sell at a lower cost and you have the neighborhood store who has to sell at a higher cost to the consumer. And you don't realize that Walmart, a place like that, will have uh, higher safety. They're going to pick their locations based on that. They get to sell a hell of a lot more of these items in general so they can have a lower margin on those. And they have lower delivery costs because they don't have to worry about the extra cost of getting somebody who's delivering, delivering that specific type of item or delivering into a da more dangerous area where it's more likely they're going to have issues around that. So then we can talk about income, specifically income disparities. One of the big things that you have to look at, and this is something that's so obvious once it's pointed out to you, is that you have to look at the median age of the people who are working. So Japanese Americans have way higher median age and way higher median income. It's not as easy as just saying that, okay, well, there's a disparity, it must be discrimination. Three quarters of education degrees go to women, three quarters of engineering degrees go to men. So you can't just jump straight to the employers and say, why are you hiring disproportionate amounts of men and women for those two types of employment when? And the people who are coming out of higher education with these degrees break down in this way. So to understand the decisions that people have to make, you must understand the costs and restraints related to it. So like in South Africa during apartheid, there were laws on the books that limited black workers for companies. You could only have a certain number of black workers, but companies would shirk these laws and hire more than were legal because it made economic sense for them. And what happens is that you have the employers who pay a price for discrimination, the discriminatory laws that are put into place, where legislators pay no price. They don't have that direct connection to it where they have to suffer when they make the bad decisions like that. Where there is no free market, there are no costs for discrimination type 2. Again, that's type 2 is the arbitrary one that doesn't take into account some empirical evidence and just attacks people based on their group membership. If you have a free market, there are costs to that because you're losing out on people who are otherwise qualified for the job based on an arbitrary characteristic that doesn't have any relevance. But when you don't have a free market, like in things like public utilities and nonprofits and government employment, then people can discriminate, type 2 discriminate all they want. It's not going to have that, that cost. In the South, specifically, you had legislation that started passing related to the bus laws. And this is one thing that some people have pointed out that it's another thing you don't really realize until you realize it, until you're told about it, is that the busing laws that segregated bus riders, these aren't something that were imposed by the companies who decided that, oh, we're so racist, we want to make sure that these people are put in their place. Before they had these busing laws come into effect, people could sit wherever they wanted. The busing companies didn't want to offend black customers any more than any other kind of customer. They wanted as many customers as possible. They fought against the laws and didn't enforce the laws once they were in place until they were fined by the government. And things like trains, specifically, they had to buy extra coaches so they could segregate passengers when in their best interest, in their economic interest, no matter how they felt personally about whatever, in their economic interests, it would have been better for them to have fewer coaches and just let everybody sit wherever they wanted to sit. 
Then we jump into minimum wage laws, which of course we've talked about uh, on multiple occasions before. What happens is that when you raise minimum wages, that you will increase competition for low-skilled jobs. So you lower the number of employees generally because a lot of jobs are lost when that kind of thing happens. A lot of businesses go out of business because they can't afford it. But it will also increase competition and make it harder for unskilled employees, potential employees, to find work. It also reduces the cost of discrimination, type 2 discrimination, the bad kind, for employers because there's less pressure on the other end to make sure that you're finding the best person for the best price. Now you have more people to choose from, so if you want to be discriminatory, you can be discriminatory. So something like the FULSA, the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, it was actually repealed by inflation for a little bit there because inflation was so high around this time that it pushed up wages above where the minimum wage would be. So the minimum wage was irrelevant to how you were trying to determine, you know, who gets hired and who doesn't. And you had lower black unemployment in 1948 when there was no effective minimum wage when inflation was so high. Then what you had after like 1967, once inflation abated, the unemployment rates went up disproportionately for these employees. And not only do you have the lower skilled employees who get priced out of the market like this, then they have attendant effects of that because now they have reduced work experience, they have fewer job skills, and they don't get to carry those on into later life where so much of that is built on experience and being able to use that for future employment opportunities. And then in a similar vein, you have ideas or policies that might seem like they're well-intentioned, but things like building restrictions to be able to save land. This is something that happened a lot in California. You restrict where you can build, and then you have this steep rise in the prices of housing in the area. And that disproportionately impacts, especially for lower-income potential homeowners. There was uh, this issue in Harlem where you had this strong white resistance to blacks moving in at the time, but the white landlords in the area who accepted black applicants were making more money. They were doing much better because they were just taking what the market had to offer. Okay, and then we have to talk about the way that people sort and unsort. And the self-sorting doesn't necessarily, it's not going to be strictly based on those kind of characteristics. So you had a lot of black homeowners who specifically would self-sort into their own groups away from black renters. And you have the enclaves like we talked about in, in Thomas Hull's other book that we read. We had uh, northern blacks who were, are, were a particular enclave who resisted southern blacks when they started migrating up north. There were strong trends in places like Cleveland and Chicago that were against the migrating Southern blacks. They tried to get them to assimilate like the they did with the Irish and Jewish settlers in the area or immigrants in the area. Those migrating from the South were much more numerous. Then there are some particular stories, like there's this one professor, Professor Wilson, he was a Harvard professor, and he talked about how he was mad because when he would he would he lived in a very posh area in this building, and when he would get on the elevator, he when he wore dressed down, he wore like like gym clothes or something like that. White people in the elevator would become apprehensive when he got on the elevator to the point where one day he, he said, don't worry, I'm a Harvard professor. I've lived here for 20 years. But they wouldn't be apprehensive when he would wear a tie and a suit when he got on the elevator. It would be fine. And Sol here talks about how it wasn't because because of race, because obviously when he had a tie on, then he didn't have to worry about that. But what's happening is he, he is paying a price for the actions of the southern enclave of blacks that made it to the north. And then he references another professor, Walter E. Williams, who talks about the how the physical attributes are cheap to observe over more costly attributes, like getting to know somebody and knowing them personally and who they are and how they function and their behavior and all that sort of thing. So... And one thing to keep in mind, like this whole idea is really, really important, as he talked about in his other book, is that you had an enclave of very plugged in, high functioning doctors and lawyers of northern blacks who resented the southern blacks, a different enclave moving in, who had picked up all the the habits and inclinations and disinclinations of poor southern whites, who had in turn picked those uh, uh, cultural artifacts from the Celts that came from England and around England. But this was something that they resented that they had to deal with that they were doing wonderfully you know he talks about Dunbar Dunbar was an incredible all-black school where the graduates were more likely to go to college than any other school in DC and had better scores than in DC better scores than two out of the three white schools in the area it was a great institution but once you had the desegregation of the schools then Dunbar failed so it's not a matter of simple segregation so like in the north 
North, when you had this particular enclave, there were there wasn't school segregation. It was perfectly fine. People functioned very well together. And then you had the the Southern enclave that arrived and caused a whole bunch of problems. And then you had segregation become the norm. And then you had to be de- desegregated, you know, after Brown v. Board of Education. And then that caused all sorts of problems because it wasn't really about the bias that people were talking about. And it's the people who are sorting and unsorting or being sorted and unsorted. They're the ones who are paying the price here. It's not the government officials who are making these determinations. And it's rarely discussed that you have the negative consequences of the pre-existing residents when you have this kind of sorting and unsorting. Then we can turn to numbers and how they are used in misleading ways, such as when it comes to home mortgages. This is definitely something that is brought up over and over again, how there was a disproportionate amount of black applicants being turned down for home mortgages, and there was this demand for the government to do something about it. But at the same time, in the same areas, for the same reasons, whites were turned down at twice the rate for home mortgages as Asians and native Hawaiians. And that's not talked about. That's not a a source of concern. And of course, it was the case that 52% of black applicants and 16% of white applicants had credit so low they could only get to subprime mortgages. And black-owned banks specifically turned down black applicants at a higher rate than white ones. Then we go into income statistics, where the most important point made here is that these are not fixed categories. The top 20% and the bottom 20% are not the same people (laughs) over time. So of the poorest of the poor in the bottom 20%, 95% of those were no longer there over a period of time. They would end up getting out of that. You also have to look at age. Age is so important when it comes to income, because the older you get, the more likely you're going to have the experience and skills necessary to have a higher income. And if there's a person who was in poverty when they were young, Younger, and then they get a job and they work and they get out of poverty. That's not reflected in these kind of statistics where you see that happening. You just have new people entering that bottom 20%. And the rich, by, by the same token, they're not enduring in those brackets as well. They are going in and out of that top 20% in the same way. And then there's a little bit more talk about the minimum wage. And he talks here about how when you talk to businesses who have been able to implement the minimum wage or who aren't affected by it, and there was a study that was a survey of those kinds of companies, then it's like taking a survey of only the people who survived Russian roulette and saying that it's a safe game to play. But it has significant deleterious effects on those businesses who didn't survive the game of Russian roulette. And then other numbers that he brings up, specifically crime statistics, this one's a big one, and it's an amazing analogy that he puts here. So the question of whether there is some type two discrimination going on when it comes to police targeting blacks for arrest. And he puts it like this. So in the NBA, you have referees who are calling fouls disproportionately, dramatically disproportionately against black players, much more than their share of the population. And so you would say that that is a disparity and therefore it must be proof of type 2 discrimination, evil racism, and it needs to be rooted out. Of course, when you look at the NBA, NBA is 80 to 85 percent black and black players get way more time on the floor than other players. So it would make perfect sense for referees to call fouls on black players to to a a highly disproportionate degree. So that's why these things are not so simple as it's a disparity, therefore it must be discrimination. Okay, and we're moving on into the end credits here, and this is double the time that I expected it to be. The invincible fallacy. This is something that he brings up. So if there were no intervention or genetic deficiency, then there would be perfect equality. That is the fallacy, is to think that just because you didn't have those things, any intervention from the outside or any genetic deficiency, that we would suddenly have perfect equality. The large disparities are the rule. That's what happens in nature. That's what would happen with people. Under any circumstances, you would have large disparities. The real test of policies is what happened when they have been applied, not what their good intentions are. He offers some solutions here. He suggests that luck is something that people often deny, and he would be right along the lines of Nassim Nicholas Taleb, that book that we read recently. Fortuitous factors can have a huge impact on where people end up, and there's no control over luck or the past, and you have to control what you can. What we can control is the incentives that are in place to encourage behavior, and that's what we should be looking at, creating the best incentives, but otherwise staying out of it. Government solutions can be the biggest problem. Of course, was that Reagan quote that the most terrifying words in the English language, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. We end up in the situation where words trump reality and the government specifically has barriers in place to prevent the recognition of mistakes or fixing those mistakes. 
Like there's this issue where you have these housing solutions in San Francisco where in San Francisco, a family of four making $100,000 a year can be subsidized for housing in extremely expensive San Francisco housing market. Now, there's no reason on earth the taxpayers should be subsidizing the choice of people in San Francisco to stay in an extremely expensive place that they can't afford. Just like he talked about in another book where I think it was in Basic Economics where he talked about how places where they get hurricanes and the houses get absolutely destroyed and the government comes in and says, oh, there's been a disaster. We have to help with the disaster. And they rebuild these houses. They are just subsidizing really stupid decisions. And then there's some talk about redistribution and how economic capital can be redistributed, but human capital cannot. That's in people's heads. And there's little talk about the effect of the confiscation of wealth. They did something like that in Detroit, and it drove most of the economically successful people out and the people with human capital out. And then you have a complete disaster area as a result. All right, so there's there's the book. I if you couldn't tell, I absolutely love this book. I think it's extremely important. I will be reading it again multiple times. I can't believe that it, it only came out in 2018. I thought when I saw the title of it, I thought it was from a long time ago. But Thomas Sowell is still at it. Everybody needs to read it, not just for the information, but for the means of thinking. It shows you how to think about complex problems and not be dogmatically wedded to some answer to those problems. It's a fantastic analogy with the referees in the NBA that's just excellent. And the definitions of discrimination, I think it's something that I'm just going to use from now on. You have type 1 discrimination that is based on evidence, but it could be type 1A, which means an individual. So you have evidence about an individual or type 1B that's based on a group, which is less ideal, but still you're using evidence to try to determine what a group's going to do. And then there's type 2 discrimination, which is just arbitrary and it's based on animus. And that's the type of discrimination that we should root out and not have because it's bad for everybody. Then you have the talk about the minimum wage. Of course, we've talked about this before. It just increases demand for low-skilled jobs, and it completely prices out all the people who need those unskilled jobs desperately. So it's a really bad idea. Big picture-wise, okay, so how we arrived at where we are is so incredibly complex. This is something that I'm realizing more and more. There are millions of factors that we are completely unaware of, and Jordan Peterson, he talked about in one of his lectures how being lost in love is a heuristic, and that's an arrogant one to pretend to know that a person's going to be the same person for decades. You know, it's some it's a shortcut that we have to use. It's an oversimplification of the world, so it's digestible to us, but this is what we do everywhere. We're machines that abuse reality for our purposes, and we should never forget that. So, this was Coffee House, and I really appreciate you listening. I hope you enjoyed this book. I hope a lot of you will go out and read it, and we are going to do discussion on Thursday, and then we'll have another book coming up after that, but we're going to have some mixed-in stuff along the way, and hopefully you'll enjoy that too. We are going to try to get this thing over the hump to be a real, genuine show, not the wooden boy that's been clacking in front of you. Uh, Try to have a real production, a real schedule, and uh, all the trimmings that come along with it so we'll uh, we'll see how that goes but i hope all is well hope you have a good week and i'll see you on the next one all right bye